Mr. Speaker. Mr. S Mr. Speaker, first of all, I am sure the whole House will want to join me in sending our very best wishes to His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh following the news that he has been admitted to hospital. Our thoughts are with Her Majesty the Queen and the whole royal family, and we wish him a full and speedy recovery. Yeah. Mr Speaker, let me also join the Leader of the Opposition in condemning the appalling terrorist attack in his constituency earlier this week. And let me pay tribute to the work that he did through the night with his constituents on Sunday. I know the thoughts and prayers of the whole House are with the family and friends of the victim who died and all those who were injured. And I'm sure the whole House will want to pay tribute to the police and the emergency services for once again responding with extraordinary professionalism and courage that makes our whole country so proud of them. Yeah. This was the fourth terrorist attack on our country in three months, following the attacks here in Westminster, in Manchester and at London Bridge. This time it was an attack on British Muslims as they left their place of worship at a sacred time of year. It was a brutal and sickening reminder that terrorism, extremism and hatred can take many forms and that our determination to tackle them must be the same whoever is responsible. Yeah. And this Queen's speech takes important steps in helping us to do so. We will review our counter-terrorism strategy to ensure the police and security services have all the powers they need and that the length of custodial sentences for terrorism-related offences are sufficient to keep people safe. We will work to reach international agreements that regulate cyberspace to prevent the spread of extremism and terrorist planning and encourage tech companies to do more to remove harmful content from their networks. And we will establish a new commission for countering extremism as a statutory body to help fight hatred and extremism in the same way as we have fought racism because this extremism is every bit as insidious and destructive to our values, and we will stop at nothing to defeat it. Yeah. Yeah. And, Mr Speaker, I hope that whatever our disagreements, we can all at least welcome the focus in this Queen's speech on stamping out extremist and hateful ideology of any kind, including Islamophobia. Yeah. For, like all terrorism in whatever form, Monday's attack sought to drive us apart and to break the precious bonds of solidarity and citizenship that we share in this country, and our response must be to stand together more strongly than ever, to show that, in just one moment, to show that hatred and evil of this kind will never succeed, and that our values and our way of life will always prevail. I give way to the right honourable gentleman. That's a forgiving way. I think the whole House would agree with what she said. Does she agree with me that we need to work with communities and engage with communities? that is all communities, they should play a leadership role in ensuring that we reject once and for all terrorism. The, the, right gen the Right Honourable Gentleman is absolutely right, and I was struck when I visited Finsbury Park on uh, Monday to see the way in which the interfaith, various faith communities there were coming together. Uh, I saw representatives from the, uh, from the Muslim faith, from the Jewish uh, community, from the Christian community, all coming together with one uh, one ambition, which is to drive extremism and hatred out of our society. I'm very great. Prime Minister, giving way. This is the first time we come together after Manchester, London Bridge, and of course, Finsbury Park. Countering extremism and terrorism of all kinds must be a priority for this government. Would she join me in calling on all members of this House mm -hmm. to give our security agencies the tools they have asked for in this gracious speech so they can do the job properly? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm grateful to my honourable friend for the intervention that he has made, and I would hope, given that I believe there is a desire across this whole House for us to deal with terrorism and drive out terrorism and extremism of all kinds, that all members of this House will feel able to support the Government in measures that we bring forward to do just that. Or giving way. When she was Home Secretary, she took a decision to weaken the surveillance powers yeah, of the police yeah, yeah. and intelligence services <laughs> by abolishing control yeah, orders. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Will she now accept that that decision was a mistake? Will she review it and will she strengthen the powers of the police and intelligence services in the very difficult task that they have to do 
of monitoring suspects who may have the intent of doing harm but who have not yet committed a crime. Yeah. Yeah. The, the right honourable gentleman refers to control orders. Of course, what was happening with the control orders that a previous Labour government had introduced was that they were increasingly being knocked down in the courts. We introduced the terrorism prevention and investigation measures. We have subsequently enhanced those measures. We have also ensured, through the Investigatory Powers Act, which we introduced when I was Home Secretary, that our police and our intelligence and security agencies have powers they need. What we have seen now is an increase in the tempo of attack planning. And remember, uh, we have seen these terrible terrorist attacks that have taken place. Over the same time period, five other plots have been foiled by our police and security services. This shows the increasing scale and tempo, and it's in that context that we need to look at the powers for the future to ensure uh, that our security services and our police have the powers they need. And I look forward to the right honourable gentleman joining us in ensuring that we give those powers to our agencies. Mr Speaker, I would also like to say a few words about the disaster at Grenfell Tower. Uh, I will give way to the... I thank the Prime Minister for giving way. Uh, the Prime Minister will be aware that across the country concerns have been raised about the cuts to policing in the last yeah, yeah. Parliament and the impact that that has also had on the connection between police and our communities. Will she now today also confirm that she will look to reverse uh, those cuts to make sure that we have that connection at a time when there are greater demands on police time and that we need to have much greater reassurance and connection back with our communities? Yeah, yeah, yeah. As, the, as I'm sure the Honourable Lady is aware, we have protected counter-terrorism policing. We're providing funding for an uplift in armed policing. But we are... We are, we are also... We are also protecting police budgets, which of course, which of course, which of course is different to the view that was put forward by the former Shadow Home Secretary, now the Mayor of Manchester, who said the police could take 10% cuts in their budget. We didn't listen to that, we protected them. Mr Speaker, I would also like to say a few words about the disaster at Grenfell Tower. The whole country was heartbroken by the horrific loss of life and the utter devastation that we have seen. I am sure the whole House will join me in sending our deepest condolences to the friends and families of all those who lost loved ones, and today we also think of those who survived but lost everything. One lady I had met ran from the fire wearing no more than a T-shirt and a pair of knickers. She had lost absolutely everything. So let me be absolutely clear. The support on the ground for families in the initial hours was not good enough. People were left without belongings, without roofs over their heads, without even basic information about what had happened, what they should do, and where they could seek help. That was a failure of the state, local and national, to help people when they needed it most. As Prime Minister, I apologise for that failure. And as Prime Minister, I have taken responsibility for doing what we can to put things right. That is why each family whose home was destroyed is receiving a down payment from the emergency fund so they can buy food, clothes and other essentials. And all those who have lost their homes will be rehoused within three weeks. There will also be an independent public inquiry chaired by a judge to get to the truth about what happened and who was responsible and provide justice for the victims and their families who suffered so terribly. All those with an interest, including survivors and victims' families, will be consulted about the terms of reference, and those affected will have their legal costs paid. And because it is clear that the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea have not been able to cope with the scale of the tragedy, we will also develop a new strategy for resilience in major disasters, which could include a new civil disaster response task force that can help at times of emergency. And finally, Mr Speaker, we must learn some of the lessons of this and previous disasters where bereaved families have not had the support they need. I will give way to An estimated 8% of London's population live in tower blocks, and uh, the same point has been made in respect of other cities. Inner London authorities, such as Westminster, have lost 45% of their funding in recent yeah. years. That includes responsibilities for environmental health. Yeah. In Kensington, the figure is 38%. Will she today guarantee local authorities will be fully funded for an urgent review of tower block safety yeah. and all remedial action that is necessary, including the installation of sprinklers, yeah. yeah. where appropriate, so they can proceed in a matter of days yeah. with that yeah. comfort? Yeah. Yeah. And will she agree also right, that Karen. regulation 
is a necessary element yes. of a safe yeah, society, yeah, yeah, not a burden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she will legislate yes. swiftly, when necessary, to ensure all yeah. high-rise residents are safe. Yeah. Yeah. We all, across this whole House, we all share a desire to ensure that people are safe and can have the confidence of being uh, safe in their homes. The work is being the work started immediately by uh, the Department for Communities and uh, Local Government, encouraging local authorities, and they have been working with the fire service to look at to look at the issues in their tower blocks and to assess those tower blocks. We do not yet know the. Uh, absolute cause of the fire in Grenfell Tower. That work is ongoing. We will take what action is necessary coming out of that, including les- learning the lessons that, are le- uh, uh, that come out of it. She speaks about the issue, of, the Honourable Lady speaks about the issue of regulation. Of course, there is uh, rigorous fire regulation in place. If there are requirements to change that that come out if there are requirements to change that that come out of the investigation that is currently taking place, then of course we will act and we will do so swiftly. And just, Mr Speaker, so honourable and right honourable members of this House are aware, there are of course a number of investigations. Uh, the police have opened a criminal investigation. The Fire Service and the Building Research Establishment are investigating as quickly as possible the exact cause of the fire so that any action that is required as a result of that can be taken. And of course, there is the public inquiry that I've also announced. And finally, as I said, Mr. Speaker, we must learn some of the lessons of this and previous disasters where bereaved families have not had the support they need. So we will also introduce an independent public advocate for public disasters, a strong independent voice for victims acting on behalf of bereaved families and supporting them at public inquests and inquiries. Mr Speaker, let me join the Leader of the Opposition in paying tribute to the two Members of Parliament that we lost in the course of the last year. Gerald Kaufman was an outstanding parliamentarian who served this House and his constituents in Manchester for an incredible 46 years. Uh, We didn't agree on everything, but as Father of the House, he was an invaluable source of wisdom and experience for members on all sides, and he will be greatly missed. And the despicable murder of Joe Cox shocked and devastated this House and this country. Joe was an inspirational MP, a campaigner and a humanitarian whose mission in life was defined by hope and love. Her killer sought instead to spread hate and division. But last weekend, as part of the great get-together, I and uh, uh, many hundreds of thousands of others, I'm sure, uh, members of this House, in her honour, came together, stood together, pulled together all across the country to unite against that hatred and to prove, in Joe's own words, that we have far more in common than that which divides us. And I'm sure that the whole House will join me in paying tribute also to Joe's husband, Brendan, for the extraordinary courage and strength that he has shown in dealing with such personal tragedy and for honouring Joe's memory in such an inspiring way. Whatever our disagreements in this House, may we all honour Joe's memory and show that in our United Kingdom, hope will always triumph over hate. Mr Speaker, the House will know that the first part of a successful Queen's speech is finding someone to propose it. And it is, of course, intended to be a witty speech, as indeed the speech from my right honourable friend, the member for Newbury, was today. From my point of view, a little too witty, because he took all the jokes that I had written in my speech. Uh, But I have to say that my... Wait for it. My my right honourable friend, over the years that he has been the member for Newbury and in the years when he was fighting to take the seat, has shown a great commitment to his constituents, but also to the important task of government of building a stronger economy and a fairer society. And I know, for example, as a fellow Berkshire MP, the work he has done to raise awareness of an issue that I'm particularly concerned about, namely the issue of mental health. Uh, He's also made a significant contribution during his time as a minister. Uh, I understand that once as Fisheries Minister, he mixed up his cod and his skate. But I'm sure that, like the rest of us, he won't fail to welcome the absence in this House today of salmon. (laughs) My my right honourable friend... My right honourable friend... I wonder if the Prime Minister's reason for not welcoming the former uh, Honourable Member is that he scares her. (laughs) (laughs) I 
I, I, I have to say to the Honourable Lady, the reason I'm not welcoming the former Honourable Member to this House is because it was beaten by a Conservative in the election. My, um, my right honourable friend, my right honourable friend, uh, the member for Newbury, showed great skill and tenacity over his three years of negotiations on the common fisheries policy. It started with the UK as a minority of one and ended with the EU unanimously supporting a reform agenda, the principles of which will be at the heart of the fisheries bill in this Queen's speech. He was also the minister who secured cross-party support for moving our canals and waterways from the public to the charitable sector creating the Canal and River Trust, one of the biggest and best endowed charities in this country. He made an excellent speech today in the finest traditions of this House. And, Mr Speaker, the Queen's speech was brilliantly seconded by my honourable friend, the member for Spelthorne. My, my honourable friend, the member for Spelthorne, is a distinguished political historian and a prolific writer, as the Leader of the Opposition pointed out. Uh, And my honourable friend, I understand, has a particular interest in female Prime Ministers. Indeed, members may know know that his most recent book profiled the most testing six months for our country's first female Prime Minister. It ran to 272 pages. I fear his next book could be somewhat longer. (laughs) My my honourable friend is also is also widely regarded for his good looks. The Sunday Telegraph once described him... (laughs) The Sunday Sunday Telegraph once described him as a Tory heartthrob, and during his time on University Challenge, I gather he even made it to page three of The Sun. (laughs) Um, Perhaps uh, most significantly, my honourable friend is confounding the Daily Mail who cited the 1995 University Challenge winning team, of which my honourable friend was a member, when arguing that all too often the brainy winners of the BBC's flagship programme sink without trace after their moment in the spotlight. I couldn't disagree more, and the House has today seen my honourable friend's talents on full display. A tremendous speech with flair, substance and wit. He... um, He brings an historian's wisdom to the challenges and opportunities which our country faces, and I've no doubt he'll make a major contribution in the years ahead. Mr Speaker, let me welcome the Honourable Member for Ross, Skye and Lock Harbour as the new leader of the SNP here in Westminster. Uh, And I'm also, of course, particularly pleased to welcome to the Conservative benches my 13 Scottish Conservative colleagues... It's, it, it's good that my right honourable friend, the Scottish Secretary, will not have to put up with any more jokes about pandas. Um, Mr. S- Mr. Speaker, turnout at the election was higher than in 2015, including many more younger people. And while on this side of the House we would have preferred more of them to vote for us, more young people going to the ballot box is something we should all welcome. Let me also welcome the right honourable member for Islington. Let me also welcome the right honourable member for Islington North back to his place as the leader of the opposition. He fought a spirited campaign and he came a good second, which was, which was, which was, which was, which was, uh, which was both better than the pundits predicted and than many of his own MPs hoped for. I'll give it. Grateful to the uh, Prime Minister for giving way, or she's uh, celebrating her immense triumph during the recent <laughs> campaign. Uh, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't help but notice, as the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition went off to listen to the humble address, think back to when I was at school and I didn't see people for six weeks. And then they came back and you thought, has she shrunk or has he grown? <laughs> No, Mr. Speaker, I was hoping the Prime Minister might answer my own the, the order. We're going to hear from the Honourable Gentleman. Uh, no, I'm bottling him up. We're going to hear him. We're going to hear from him in a moment. But normally there is a response to an intervention before one has another intervention. The Prime Minister. I was indicating uh, the fact that I didn't think that intervention actually required or, or, or justified a response. In procedural terms, I'm afraid it did, and it's now received a response. As Mr always, Christian Matheson. As always, Mr Speaker, I'm inclined to agree with you. And can I thank the Prime Minister for um, 
Can I thank the Prime Minister for giving way? Can I thank her also for calling a uh, general election, which I increased my majority from 93 Yay! votes to 9,100? She talks about young people increasing their vote. In that case, why is she increasing? Why is she introducing voter suppression methods, such as such as enforcing people, uh, obliging voters to show identification before they vote? Yes. I'm sure. Anybody in this House who values democracy will also want to ensure that that democracy is fair and free of fraud. And it is in that spirit that we are introducing that we are introducing requirements for people to identify them. I think it's a perfectly reasonable requirement to ensure that people who are voting are those who are entitled to vote. I will give way to the Honourable Gentleman. I thank, thank the Prime Minister for giving me. If she values votes for young people and values democracy, I look forward to bringing forward votes for 16, 17 year olds. Well, that, that is an issue on which the Honourable Gentleman and I will continue to disagree. Mr. Mr. Speaker, the election also showed the election also showed that as it faces the big cut challenges of our future. Our country is divided, red versus blue, young versus old, leave versus remain. As I said here last week, the test for all of us is whether we choose to reflect divisions or help the country overcome them. With humility and resolve, this Government will seek to do the latter. We will do what is in the national interest and we will work with anyone in any party that is prepared to do the same. Minister's commitment to tackling social injustice. Could she perhaps say a little bit more about what we can do to stop people being discriminated on grounds of race as well? Well, I thank my honourable friend for raising that. This will reflect the outcome of the very important racial disparity audit, which we introduced uh, as virtually as soon as I became Prime Minister last year. I think it's important that we do test what is happening in relation to our public services. I was struck as Home Secretary by the examples I saw. I took action on stop and search never had been done by a Labour government, but I took action on stop and search because I thought it was important that nobody was stopped on the streets of our country because of the colour of their skin. There were other issues that we addressed in uh, government previously. Our racial disparity audit will show us what is happening in our public services and we will be able to act on the back of that to ensure truly that uh, the approach that we are taking is a fair one and that there is not that discrimination. I am going to make a little progress uh, before I give way again. Mr Speaker, we will work every day to earn the trust and confidence of the British people, and we will make their priorities our priorities, dealing head-on with the major challenges our country faces, and that is what this Queen's speech is all about. I'm just going to make a little progress, and then I will give way again. Mr Speaker, this Queen's speech is about recognising and grasping the opportunities for every community in our country to benefit as we leave the European Union. It is about delivering the will of the British people with a Brexit deal that works for all parts of our United Kingdom and that commands the greatest possible public support. It is about building a new, deep and special partnership with our European friends and neighbours because we are leaving the European Union, we are not leaving Europe. And it is about seizing it is about seizing this moment of national change to deliver a plan for a stronger, fairer Britain by strengthening our economy, tackling injustice and promoting opportunity and aspiration for all. Because, as I have said many times before, the referendum vote was not just a vote to leave the European Union, it was a profound and justified expression that our country often does not work the way it should for millions of ordinary families. And this Queen's speech begins to change that by putting fairness at the heart of our agenda. I thank the, uh, the right, my right hon. Friend for giving way. She knows that I have been a long-standing campaign for improving mental health care in this country. And the truth is that there are many people across our country today not getting the care that they need, including many children who, in very traumatised states, are spending too long in queues to get the appropriate treatment. Can the Prime Minister tell us what she is going to do to convert warm words of the government on parity of esteem into actual action on mental health. 
I commend my honourable friend, who has, as he said, uh, while he has uh, in this House and uh, before been a champion of this issue of mental health and uh, has done important work on it. There are a number of strands to what the government wants to do. Uh, One of those is actually putting in place a new Mental Health Act, but we will, of course, consult widely on that new Mental Health Act. I also want to ensure that every school, every primary and secondary school, has a member of staff who is trained to identify mental health problems and knows how to deal deal with those issues. I was very struck when I met the charity Young Minds a few weeks ago at the uh, issue of raising awareness of mental health problems, particularly among young people. The earlier we can address these issues, then the better we can deal with them and the better uh, life we can ensure that the people with these mental health problems have. So those are some of the issues that we uh, will be putting into place, but I look forward to working with my honourable friend on ensuring that what we're doing does indeed address the issues that we need to address. Well, I will give way to the honourable lady. I'm grateful to her for giving way, and it's good to see her here actually facing the other parties. Uh, She has actually turned up, which is not always the case in the election campaign. But uh, the gracious gracious speech contains eight Brexit bills, but not one single one of those bills covered the environment. It's her failure to propose a Brexit bill on the greatest challenge that we face, because she simply doesn't care about the environment and climate change. Or well, because she's been influenced by the DUP dinosaur to sit beside her and to take that kind of in the future. No. I'm very conscious of the significant amount of legislation from Europe which affects environmental matters, and those issues are being. Son, Mr. Speaker, my party was elected by the people of Northern Ireland to represent the constituents who elected us here. Is it parliamentary for the Honourable Lady to describe us in the unparliamentary terms that she did, which I regret? She does not understand the policy that my party has on the environment. She should go and read our manifesto. But we have the right to speak for the people of Northern Ireland, and in this Parliament we will. Order. Let me just say two things in response to the, I'm sure, sincere point of order from the Right Honourable Gentleman. First of all, the use of the word in question is not unparliamentary. It's a matter of taste as to its desirability or otherwise. And secondly, and I know how robust a character the honourable gentleman, the right honourable gentleman is, I would simply say that the word in question refers to a species that survived for many, many millions of years. (laughs) The Prime Minister. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mr Speaker. As I said, the Queen's speech is about putting heart fairness at the heart of our agenda. That's about building a stronger economy, delivering a modern industrial strategy so that all parts of our country and all parts of our society share in the benefits of economic growth, investing in the world leading infrastructure that can unlock growth in our economy and improve the quality of people's lives across the whole country, and building a fairer society, increasing the national living wage so that people who are on the lowest pay see their wages go up as the economy strengthens and also ensuring that every child has access to a good school place, creating a world-class system. I'm going to make a little more progress before I give way again. Creating a world-class system of technical education so that all young people have the vital skills they need to do the jobs of the future. Acting to make markets fairer by tackling unfair practices wherever they are found. I am very grateful to her giving way. The Prime Minister mentions opportunity. Does she agree that one of the opportunities we must deliver is to allow more young people to get on the housing ladder? And will she reinforce her previous commitment to increase house building to 250,000 homes a year, which is a much bolder and and a much more ambitious commitment than the party opposite? I I have to say to my honourable friend, he is incredibly prescient, because the very next sentence that I was going to say in my speech is tackling the housing crisis that locks uh, locks so many young people out of the housing market. We do indeed recognise the significance of the housing problem in this country. That is about building more houses. It's also about keeping keeping schemes going which help people to get on the housing ladder and seeing a greater diversity in the housing market, rent to buy, shared ownership, a whole variety of opportunities for young people. And also, we will be tackling discrimination on the basis of mental health, sexuality, faith, disability, gender or race. I will give way to the Honourable Gentleman. I'm very grateful. But but how is the Interim Prime Minister going to convince convince the country 
that she can negotiate a successful Brexit within the time limit with 27 other EU countries when she hasn't been able even to negotiate a deal with 10 Democratic Unionist members of this House in the time limit before the Queen's speech. Can I, can I thank the Honourable Gentleman for giving me the opportunity to uh, welcome the work that the Right Honourable Member, my uh, D- DEXU Secretary, Secretary of State for Exiting the European Union, has undertaken in relation to preparing our negotiations and starting those formal negotiations on Monday of this week. And I will be, I will be in the Brussels uh, for the EU Council later this week, taking that further forward. Mr. Mr. Speaker, building. Uh, Prime Minister. I'm also grateful that the Brexit talks have now started. As part of those talks, uh, the the ability for those people who have come from the other 27 countries to live and work in the UK, and for UK citizens living and working within the other 27 countries, is going to be vitally important. They will be waiting to learn of their future. Will she give a guarantee to this House that she will come to this House as quickly as possible, not waiting until the discussions have finished, in order to give them the assurance that they will be able to live and remain in the countries where they have decided to live and work. I'm grateful to my right honourable friend. We have always said from the beginning of this that we want to address this issue at an early stage in the negotiations, and that is indeed the agreement that has been reached. This is one of the very first issues that will be addressed in the negotiations, uh, and I will uh, make every effort and will guarantee to my right honourable friend that I expect to be able to come to this House to show the opportunities that the United Kingdom will be setting out for those EU citizens who live here in the EU. We, of course, want to see UK citizens in the European Union being treated uh, fairly as well, but uh, we will soon be setting out our offer in relation to uh, European Union citizens living here in the United Kingdom. I'll give way one more time. Grateful to the Prime Minister for giving way. The fact is that the gracious speech has been given today and the Prime Minister still can't tell us how her government will be composed or how it will be supported. And given that she asked for a very personal mandate during the general election campaign and didn't get one, the only question is why is she still here? Let me, uh, let me just point out a few, a few facts to the, uh, to the Honourable Gentleman. I mean, which party was it that got the highest percentage share of the vote? Labour or Conservative? Conservative. Which party, which party was it? Which party was it that got more votes? 800,000 more votes than the other party? Labour or Conservative? Conservative. And which party was it that got 56 more seats than the Labour Party? Order. I'm not going to... Order. Order. I will not have the Prime Minister or the Leader of the Opposition, or any member of this House shouted down. It order, Mr Campbell, I did, I'm sure you meet order. Order, you're wittering away from a sedentary position to no obvious benefit or purpose. <laughs> I'm sure you mean well. Order, I'm sure you mean well, but I don't require your assistance at this time. The Prime Minister. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I was merely pointing out that the Conservative Party got 56 more seats than the Labour Party. We are doing, but we are doing what is in the national interest, which is forming a government to address the challenges that face this country at the moment. It is a critical time. It's important that we have a government committed to the national interest. I give way to my honourable friend. Yes. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister just mentioned... Prime Minister just mentioned making markets work better and for everybody. She knows that the energy price cap had wide cross-party support from all sides of this House. So I was delighted to see energy price protection and pro-consumer switching and transparency measures in the Queen's speech. Can she confirm that those measures mean the price cap to deliver 17 million customers the £100 savings which we promised on our manifesto, rather than the narrower or more anti-competitive counter-proposals from the big six energy firms instead. I can, I can confirm to my honourable friend that we do indeed intend to take action on this, uh, on this issue. We recognise the problem that there is in relation to energy bills. We want to ensure that we get the best measure in place that is going to deliver what we all want, which is to see people no longer being ripped off by the uh, high energy tariffs that, that they are given. So, strengthening the... I'll give 
Uh, I thank the Prime Minister for giving way. The Prime Minister has talked about the national interest and the need for cross-party support. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that in her excellent proposal to have a a commission for tackling extremism, for that to work, it really does require the engagement, not just of members on this side, but of members on the other side of the House, if we are to stamp out the evil ideology of extremism that drives terrorism in this country. My honourable friend is absolutely right. We talk, we have spoken a lot about the need to deal with terrorism, and of course we do need to look at the powers we have to deal with the terrorists. But we also need to ensure that we are dealing with the extremism and hatred that fuel that terrorism. And that's why the Commission for Countering Extremism is so important. And I hope it is a measure, as I said earlier, that can be uh, supported across all parts of this House, because it is important if we are going to ensure that we drive this extremism and hatred out of our society. Mr. No, um, I have... I have already taken three times as many interventions as the Leader of the Opposition, so I will, I will make some progress on uh, my speech. Mr. Mr Speaker, we also want to build a more secure United Kingdom, investing in our defence and national security and enhancing our leading role on the world stage, strengthening the social, economic and cultural bonds between England, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales delivering on our commitment to devolution by working in cooperation with all the devolved administrations and working with all the parties in Northern Ireland to support the return of devolved government, building a country that is stronger, fairer, safer and more secure for all our children and grandchildren, a country that works for everyone. That is our ambition and that is what this Queen's speech will help to deliver. The first part of this Queen's speech is, of course, about Brexit. A Brexit deal that works for every part of the country and commands the greatest possible public support. Over 80% of the electorate backed two major parties, both of whom campaigned on manifestos that said we should honour the democratic decision of the British people. So this government will respect the will of the British people and see Brexit through. We will build, we will seek to build a wide consensus as we do this and as we take bills through this House, which will include a trade bill, a repeal bill, an immigration bill, as have been referred to, and also, also bills to deal with control of access to our waters for fishermen and greater stability to farmers uh, with a new bill on agriculture. I will just make a little more progress and then I will uh, take some more interventions. But if we are going to grasp the opportunities as we leave the European Union, we need to build a stronger economy. That is right. We have always understood, as Conservatives on this side of the House, that sound money and fiscal credibility is the foundation for everything else. That is why it was right to take the tough decisions we did after the financial crash. And it has paid off. The deficit is down by three quarters. Employment is up by 2.9 million. And because of policies like the national living wage and taking 4 million of the lowest paid out of income tax altogether, inequality has been reduced to its lowest level for 30 years. So in this Queen's speech, we will continue to improve the public finances and work towards getting our country back to living within its means. We will also invest in the world-leading digital infrastructure we need to benefit from the opportunities of new technology. And we will encourage businesses to grow and create jobs by continuing to cut corporation tax, because that's how you raise more money, not less. I thank the Prime Minister. I thank the Prime Minister for giving way. Does the Prime Minister recognise that the economy is evolving and changing, and therefore can the Prime Minister confirm that the Government is absolutely committed to securing the rights for people in the gig economy who are on different types of contracts than has been historically the case? My honourable friend is absolutely right, and we have asked Matthew Taylor to do a report on the changing workplace, the changing structure of employment that we see, uh, particularly, obviously, you see my honourable friend has referenced to the gig economy, and that re- when that report is uh, published, we will obviously look at the steps that the government needs to take to support people with their rights. But as I've said in the past few weeks, we will enhance workers' rights. We believe in protecting those rights and enhancing them. I would give way to my honourable friend. I 
thank the Prime Minister for giving way. Um, will my right hon. Friend ensure that, uh, that legislation such as uh, providing for next, next phases of the high speed rail project and other infrastructure investment means that we can rebalance the economy to make sure that the whole country benefits from the economic progress to which you refer? It is very good to see my hon. Friend in his place and to have seen him out on the campaign trail during the, uh, during the general election campaign. And I can absolutely confirm that we will put the legislation through for the next stage of HS2 and we will also ensure that we are continuing to invest, as my right hon. Friend the Chancellor set out in the autumn statement last year, in infrastructure projects around the country. Because it, I, what I want to see is a country that works for everyone and every part of the United Kingdom. And infrastructure is an important way of helping to deliver that. That. Mr. Speaker, I will give way to the Can I take her back to what she was saying about making Brexit work for the entire United Kingdom? Can she tell the House if a legislative consent motion will be required in the Scottish Parliament for the Great Repeal Bill? Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, that is a matter which is currently being considered both here and in Scotland. Uh, the, there, is, there is a possibility that a legislative There is a possibility that a legislative consent motion may be required in the Scottish Parliament, but that is a matter that is being considered currently between the uh, uh, Westminster and the Scottish Government. Uh, Mr. No, I'm not going to. Mr. Speaker, I'm conscious that I have taken a significant number of interventions, and I will make uh, I will make progress so that other members are able to rise to speak. One thing that we will not do, I have said that we will protect rights and uh, uh, protect people at work as we leave the European Union and indeed as we see changes in the employment structure in our economy. What we won't do is follow the economic prescriptions of the party opposite because there is absolutely nothing fair about punitive tax rises that lead to fewer jobs, lower wages and higher prices for ordinary working families. And there is nothing fair... There is nothing fair about racking up debts for our children and grandchildren to pay. The the only government you can trust to build a stronger and fairer economy is a Conservative government. And, Mr Speaker, I have mentioned a fairer society and I want Britain to be a genuine great meritocracy where everyone has a fair chance to go as far as their talent and hard work will take them. That is about ensuring everybody plays by the same rules. It is about ensuring every child has access to a good school place. It is about ensuring that that right technical education is there. And the measures in the Queen's speech will help to do that, but they will also deal with some of the injustices in our society. The draft domestic violence and abuse legislation to provide a statutory definition of this hideous crime and ensure robust protective orders are available and that victims get the justice they deserve. I will give way to my honourable friend, but I, may I, I, will just say, I will just say this. This is a measure that I hope will be able to command support across the whole of this House. There are many in this House who have, have championed the cause of dealing with domestic violence for many years, and I hope they will be able to join us in supporting this legislation. Morton. Mr Speaker, as the Prime Minister is very aware, victims of domestic violence are both the directed victims but also the oft forgotten indirect victims such as children. Can she reassure us that um, steps will be taken to support um, those indirect victims too? Yes. Uh, my honourable friend makes a very fair point and I think one of the problems over the years is that all too often people have looked at the immediate Um, victim or survivor of domestic violence and forgotten, for example, that if there have been children involved in a house, that uh, it's not just a question of whether they've not seen something happening. They know what's happening and they are affected by it. And we will be looking at that issue of of children. I will give way one time more to the Honourable Gentleman. Owen, quite rightly, this House praised the Prime Minister for the Hillsborough Inquiry. Today I met with the victims of contaminated blood. Will she take this opportunity now to have a full public inquiry to those affected and their families? I I, I note the point the Honourable Gentleman has made about contaminated blood. Uh, and I will speak to the Secretary of State for Health. I think this has already been looked at and other ways of dealing with this issue have already been uh, introduced and addressed. Mr. Uh, no, Mr. Speaker, 
we are building opportunity and aspiration. I want to say just just one more. We will also deliver a more secure United Kingdom because of the choices we are making to prioritise our defence and national security. Our Armed Forces Bill will give those who put their lives on the line in the service of our country the proper respect they deserve, with more security in the way they live and work. Our commitment to renew Trident means this country maintains its continuous at-sea nuclear deterrent as the ultimate guarantee of our safety and a Prime Minister who is prepared to use it. And we will continue to play a leading role in international efforts to tackle mass migration and climate change, to alleviate poverty and end modern slavery. We have always looked beyond Europe to the wider world and we will continue to do so. No, I... I, I am actually able to say this is in conclusion. This has been a difficult time, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, this has been a difficult time for our country. I know there are many parents who worry about the kind of world their children are growing up in, and I recognise that and understand it. It's been an unsettling time which has tested the spirit of our country, but we are a resilient country. Our response... Our response to disaster and acts of terror which take the lives of innocent people must be this. Compassion, unity, resolve. For we're a great nation and a great people. We have been through and survived the toughest of times before and we thrived. Once again we can and will grow stronger from the challenges we face today. The Queen's speech on its own will not solve every challenge our country faces. Not not every problem can be solved by an Act of Parliament. But it is but it is a step forward. It is a step forward to building a more compassionate, more united and more confident nation. That's what this government will aim to achieve. It's what this Queen's speech will deliver. And I commend the Queen's speech to the House.